Hi, how's it all going? Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, Kubernetes, uh, hence the really stupid title up there. Um, so my name is Paul. Uh, I am a dev advocate, uh, along with all the other guys on my team. Uh, the difference is I'm not a developer. Uh, I come from kind of a sysadmin background, uh, so I kind of got into the DevOps, and I then got into you know the Kubernetes stuff. Uh, and so I sort of uh, came here to talk a little bit about Kubernetes and uh, you know what we can do with it. I've got a fairly lengthy uh, thing. This is like a couple of the things I'll talk about. Um, and so we can kind of gauge like where we are with our comfort of things like containers and Kubernetes and just work our way through and just hit the highlights and uh, cover the bits that uh, we, we think uh, are important. Um, so first of all, like Kubernetes is a platform. Um, you know, we don't really need to go into that. I think you're all aware of what a platform does. Um, all platforms look a little like this, right? So whether it's Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes, or Amazon Web Services, you've got an API, talks to a bunch of uh, applications that then use, uh, that then talk to the actual resources to create an execution environment. Um, but the end result is to get this, right? So whether it's Kubernetes or Cloud Foundry, whatever, you've got code and you want to get it into uh, production. And so, uh, you know, Kubernetes is a little bit different from, say, Cloud Foundry, so you have to actually bring all these steps into it. Um, you know, Cloud Foundry, you just do CF push and your code starts running. Uh, with Kubernetes, you need to kind of provide um, your own CI CD tooling, your own tooling to store your uh, artifacts like uh, Docker images. Um, who here is actually actively doing things with containers? Who has done like a Docker build, Docker run before? Okay, quite a few, good. Uh, so we don't need to cover this too much. Uh, Docker did some stuff. A container's kind of like a VM, but actually nothing like a VM. Uh, we've all kind of figured that out by now. Um, this is what a, a Docker build file looks like. So this is for a, uh, a fairly standard Java app, right? Uh, and this is actually a, a, a multi-stage build file. So you can see I've got the top. I'm building it from Maven. Uh, and then I've got a second one, which is building it from uh, just a fairly small OpenJDK. Uh, and then here I'm copying the, the jar file that I've uh, compiled in the top one uh, into the second image. And so this is how I can make a much slimmer uh, Docker image for a Java app. Uh, I believe when I build it just straight from Maven, I end up with nearly a gig um, for a Hello World app, whereas with the, um, using the JDK Slim, it's like 250 meg or so. Um, so if you don't do uh, multi-stage builds like this, uh, I highly recommend doing it. And this is how you kind of, you build a container, you push that container up to a Docker registry, uh, and then you can pull that from a Docker registry and you can run it, right? And so that's kind of a really simple way of uh, showing how to use containers. Uh, and with Kubernetes, you're kind of doing most of those things, right? Uh, you're certainly doing the build and push. Hopefully, a CI system is doing it. Uh, and then Kubernetes is going to take on doing the, the pull and the, the run. Um, and that's fine for your laptop, uh, just doing Docker run. Obviously, if you've got a big old data center, you need some orchestration, and that's where you have Kubernetes. Um, it's kind of a big step forward from an infrastructure perspective. Um, like, we used to use... Uh, uh, Terraform and do like infrastructure as code, Chef, do config management, and we had a lot of code to try and make applications run on, uh, on servers. And so basically, uh, Kubernetes takes away that code uh, and makes it a lot simpler for us. Um, and what it does is like when you wrote a Chef recipe, you were writing it for like the entire server. So everything that, like the 400 steps you needed to do to get that server ready to run your app, you had to write all 400 of that. And it had to perform all 400 of those to get your application working. If one thing failed, the whole thing just blew up. Whereas with Kubernetes, so that was kind of like your, mo your monolithic application. Uh, with Kubernetes, you're actually more building your infrastructure like uh, microservices. And so you're kind of ending up with lots of small tire fires instead of one big tire fire. Um, so it's still terrible, uh, but at least the fires are smaller. Uh, and this is kind of what a Kubernetes cluster looks like. You know, it's a platform, right? So you've got a control plane, a data plane. Uh, you've got all these things running up in the control plane. These are kind of the, the, uh, the important bits. So you've got etcd, which is like the database that stores the state of the cluster and like the information about the applications you have running in that cluster. You have the scheduler and the API server that do exactly what you would think they would do. And you've got these things called the controller managers. And we'll talk a little bit about controllers as we go through uh, Kubernetes. And that's kind of your control plane. And then your data plane, it's just all the bits required to run your containers. 
Uh, so you've got Docker, obviously, um, to actually run them. Uh, you've got Kubelet, which talks to the API server to get details from the scheduler to determine what it should run for you. And then Kube Proxy helps organize the networking and connectivity uh, to your applications. So that's kind of the, the main thing. Obviously, you'd be running in some sort of clusters. So you'd have a group of masters that are clustered up and then a group of workers. They all scale really well and really easily. Uh, like etcd is really the only thing that's tricky to scale because you need to like cluster it and uh, get the data clustered across, um, do leader elections and stuff like that. The rest of it, you can pretty much just keep adding more and it just works. Um, and then you have this extra networking so that the uh, applications on each worker node can talk to each other. And the default networking option is flannel, um, but there's also like NSXT if you're on a VMware um, and a bunch of others. So that's kind of what your cluster looks like when it's actually built out and run. Um, so I mentioned controllers. And they're kind of the underpinning that uh, makes Kubernetes uh, as good as it is. And they're these tiny little control loops that uh, just make sure that like, the state that you've asked for is the state that's actually running in your cluster for a particular resource. Um, so it's kind of doing that Unix philosophy thing of just pick one thing and do that thing really well and then make them composable. You talk to Kubernetes using kubectl, um, and you've got a couple of different ways to uh, send instructions to Kubernetes. You can use uh, imperative commands, which are kind of like actions. So Kubernetes run this thing, scale this thing, or create this thing. And so you're giving direct actions to Kubernetes, and you're effectively like live editing the objects that are running in Kubernetes. Uh, so that's great for like getting started and doing quick demos because like I don't have to write this massive like YAML manif manifest file to make that happen. Um, but there, there are some downsides. Uh, with declarative, you you build out basically a Kubernetes manifest, which is a YAML file or a JSON file, um, and they basically you describe the object that you want. You're almost giving it like the API payload, but in like a JSON or a, a YAML format. Uh, and what you end up with is this lovely like, text file that you can store in uh, source control. Um, so that kind of makes declarative uh, the more interesting way of running, running applications, especially when you're talking about like, running things in production, right? Because you would store that manifest file and the other manifest files that go along to make your application run on Kubernetes in version control. You tie them up to your CI system, and so now you're kind of doing the infrastructure as code, but with just a blob of YAML versus a ton of uh, Terraform. Um, so you kind of have those two, two ways of doing it. Generally speaking, when you're doing real things, you'll do declarative. When you're just uh, like wanting to quickly run something and learn how a particular app works or something, you might use the imperative, you know, kubectl create or run. Um, you have these manifests. Um, most people these days are using YAML because it's a little bit easier for a human to read and write, uh, as long as you can count white space, which is really easy, right? Um, so you've got like four major things. You've got the version of the API you want to talk to, the type of resource you want, metadata, which is usually like a name, a namespace, and maybe a bunch of la labels, and then you've got your spec. And this is basically your API spec. Um, so this is asking for a pod, and so the, my spec is the, like the image that I want to run, right? Um, it can be a lot more detailed than, that, than this, but this is kind of the bare minimum. Um, so a bunch of uh, resource kinds that uh, Kubernetes knows about. Um, the, kind of the main ones uh, that you would use to get like a basic application running, pods, services, and volumes. So pods are basically the execution environment for your application. So it's not your application and it's not your container, it's the execution environment. So it's basically the, like if you look under it, it's like the kernel uh, user uh, namespace and uh, C groups, um, and then your, the containers run inside of that. And so you can run more than one container in a pod, uh, and you do that if you have to do like some initialization first, or if say running in uh, a PHP app where you need Nginx and PHP FPM, you would run them inside the same pod and they would share networking so they could talk over local host. Uh, and you would also share volumes. So if you wanted to have a socket so they could talk over the socket, you could do that as well. But generally speaking, you have one container per pod. Uh, and that's really the minimum scalable unit of your application. So back to my PHP example, if you're running WordPress, you wouldn't put MySQL in that same pod. You would put MySQL outside of that pod uh, because it's kind of a different scalable unit of your application. Uh, and you, so you have this pod. You do like a kubectl apply or kubectl run pod. 
uh, and the schedule it will pick a uh, worker node to run it on, and it will start running. And the kubelet that it gives it to is responsible for keeping that pod running. So if that pod dies, the kubelet will just restart it. Um, and then if that whole node dies, you lose your application. Um, and so that's not very, uh, like, it's not very high available, right? And so you start to get these controllers. The first set, the first controller is a replica set, and that basically ensures that a set number of replicas of your application is running. So if I ask for three, the replica set controller will then say, are there any running? No, okay, go and create me three pods. And then it will track that there's three pods running of that spec, and then if one dies, it will create a new one, and you'll still have three. And so generally, like replica set is, becomes a minimum scalable unit, because you can ask for one, and it will make sure there's always run, one running. So if uh, a node dies, it will get that one running somewhere else. Uh, and you can resize, so you can say, oh, now I want five, and it will go, oh, you need two more. It'll create two more. And you can actually scale all the way down to zero. So if you want the metadata and the details about your application to remain in the cluster, but you don't want it running right now, you can ask for a size of zero, uh, which becomes super useful when you're doing upgrades, like rolling upgrades and stuff. Uh, and if you want to do rolling upgrades and stuff, uh, you can program that all yourself, or you can ask for a deployment which has the smarts of that. And so they basically wrap around a replica set and add the smarts to be able to do a rolling deployment. So here I've asked for a deployment. Um, I've got three pods. Uh, I upgrade it. Um, see, I changed my image, which is an upgrade. It spins up three new pods, so it basically spins up a new replica set, and when that's fully online, it then resizes the old one to zero. And so, boom, we have uh, rolling restarts of our application uh, without you having to do any work. Final one that I'll talk about, uh, pod-related, is a stateful set. And it's basically a deployment, but uh, the, no, the pods are brought up one at a time in order, and everything has a strict name. And so if you're sending up, say, a Cassandra cluster, and you have to know the first pod's name so you can cluster the rest to it, uh, you use a stateful set. And you can also tie persistent volumes to stateful sets so that your data lives on beyond the life of the pod as well. And you can kind of show that's the stateful set doing it, and that's the stateful set with a persistent volume. Um, so let's actually uh, try it out. So I'm going to run kubectl run. So this is a Spring Hello World app. Um, it's telling me the run command is deprecated, so I shouldn't do that for too much longer, but it's good enough for now. And so you can see I have uh, three resources that have been created. Uh, a, a deployment, uh, which created the replica set, uh, which then created the pod, right? And so you can see the three types of controllers um, coordinating the, this thing for me, and you can see it's already running, so that was pretty quick. Uh, so then I can do a, say I can do a scale, uh, replicas three, and then do a get all again. And you can see it's starting up, uh, it's starting up three. And you can see the counts here have changed uh, to show how many that I'm expecting and how many are actually available. And now I can uh, edit it. And if I can get my YAML right, we can actually uh, upgrade it. The easiest way for me to do this is to add an environment variable. Okay, assuming I got that right, which I did. Uh, so that will see that something changed in the spec, and it will do a, a rolling upgrade. So if I do a get all now, we should see that uh, we've got two replica sets. We've got the old one, uh, which has got now a desired of zero, uh, and then the new one, which is desired three. And you can see it, my, three new app, my three new ones are running, and the last of my uh, old ones has been terminated. So that's kind of just Kubernetes doing a rolling upgrade for me, um, which used to take me like a lot of chef to be able to do a, uh, a rolling upgrade. So that's pretty cool. Um, now I want to actually access my application. Um, and if you look back here, there's not really any hints about how I can access my application. Um, I don't have any IP addresses or anything. 
So I, I need a service, and a service is how you expose applications to uh, the internet uh, and to you. Um, but if I just want to quickly test it, I can do a port forward. So I can do uh, um, better pick one of those uh, six. Okay, so that's basically forwarding from uh, localhost up to the, Kube Cuddle, to the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and so if I do a curl, I should. And so that's the, that's the environment variable I just set, right? Uh, and so clearly it's working. Um, and so, yeah, that just forwards a local port from my localhost up to my Kubernetes cluster. And I use this a ton, right? Because often I'll have something up and running like, a, um, like Grafana or something, and I don't want to expose that to the outside world. And I also want it to be authenticated. So I could go and add a bunch of like um, OAuth authentication proxies and stuff in front of it, or I can just know that I, if I kube, if I kube cuddle uh, port forward, I'm using Kubernetes authentication to ensure I have access to like the, the namespace and the pods I'm working with, and so that gives me quasi uh, authentication and also gives me some protection because you can't access it from the outside world. So I, I use this a ton, um, but if you did want to expose it to the outside world. Um, you could do, run an expose command. You can see I'm setting a type of load balancer, and I'm setting the ports to use. So the target port is uh, port 8080 in my container. Um, and so now, if I do a, okay, do a get all, we should see a service. Yeah, so you see we've got that uh, service, type of load balancer, uh, and then it's got the cluster IP, um, which is an internal IP that can only be accessed by other pods running in the cluster. And then we have this uh, external IP that's sitting as pending. Uh, so that'll take a minute or so. And that's actually using the cloud controller manager to go underneath the cloud and configure a load balancer to uh, load balance for my uh, service. And so while it's doing that, we can quickly talk about services. That was my command. That's it showing up. So basically, you ask for a service. Uh, it tracks pods based on metadata. So basically, the labels you set in pods, you tell the service to watch for those labels. And any that it shows up, it adds to uh, the service as a thing it cares about. Uh, and it provides connectivity and service discovery, um, service discovery via DNS. So there's, there's a DNS server running inside Kubernetes. And so it, this is called hello. So anything in my cluster can just like ping hello, and we'll get a response, or curl hello and get a response. But nothing outside my cluster can access it because it only has a cluster IP. So I can then use a, a node port which takes that cluster IP and it maps a port on the external IP of all of my worker nodes uh, to that cluster IP and that cluster IP is then load balancing to my applications. So now if I know the IP address and that port of any of my worker nodes, I can access my application. Um, but that's a little bit unwieldy and since the Kubernetes cluster already knows these things, it can just go out and create a load balancer for me. Uh, and so it does that when I ask for a type of load balancer. And so now I just need to know the IP address um, of the load balancer. And uh, in a lot of situations, I can actually specify an IP address if I have known public IP addresses, and I want to make sure it stays the same. Uh, and then you've got this ingress controller, which kind of adds uh, layer seven rules. So you can do like uh, the URL host name, or you can do like host path um, uh, rules to basically send it to different services. Uh, generally, a service uh, is for one set of pods or one application. And so if you've got a Kubernetes cluster with 100 apps, you've, got a, you've probably got 100 services, which means you've got 100 load balances, which means you're paying Google a lot of money. Um, so you can do maybe get by with, say, 10 or whatever and use host paths or use uh, host names to uh, send rules down. Uh, and you can also like, make multiple applications look like one, multiple APIs look like one based off one URL. right? So, Pretty useful, and it will also add SSL termination. So if you're not doing any SSL or TLS in your application, you can actually configure the load balancer with an ingress and give it your certificate and key, and it will configure HTTPS for your application and then do HTTP inside of your cluster. Um, so that's pretty useful as well. Um, let's have a look if that is done. It probably is. So there's my public IP. So we can curl that and we get hello London. Um, so that is indeed working. 
Uh, next, you have volumes, and they're just a directory that's mapped into all of the containers of a pod. Um, fairly simple. You can just do it straight from like a host, or you can have it like an empty, vo empty uh, volume. But generally speaking, you'll use some sort of uh, shared storage and do a persistent volume, because generally it's because you've got a database or you've got like sessions or something you want to persist maybe through like pod failures. And so you would use a persistent volume, and that would basically say you're on Google Cloud. It would map it from the Google Cloud block, uh, block file storage. And if your pod is rescheduled to another node, it will unmap it from the old node, map it to the new node, and get the storage inside of your uh, pods. Um, so you kind of get that storage follows your pod along, uh, which is super useful, uh, especially if you're doing stateful sets. You can also mount volumes from config maps and secrets. So config maps and secrets are basically key value stores. Um, and so let's go ahead and create one. I just want to change the message a little bit. All right, so that's creating a config map, and we'll come back to that in a second. Um, now, if I was creating it from a file, uh, this is what it would look like. So you've got your, your usual uh, data up here, and then the actual uh, spec is this data block. If it's coming from a file, it basically the key is the file name, and the value of that key is the contents of that file. Um, or you can just pass literal key value pairs. Uh, and then that will either be, you can tell it to load this as a volume, in which case it will write these files out with the contents, or you can load them as envir environment variables, in which case the, um, the key and the value get loaded up as environment variables into your pods. Um, so super useful for doing configuration files or setting environment uh, configuration settings. Um, secrets are basically the same as a config map, except you can't read that. Uh, and that is not encrypted. It is base64 encoded, and that is in case you have like binary secrets. There is some work to make secrets encrypted by default, um, but it is not currently the, 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 uh, uh, the way it works. Um, but I think we'll see that coming along really soon. And you can already um, encrypt them at rest, like you can encrypt your HCD cluster. So at least like on disk, they're not written out as uh, something that's uh, decodable. Um, but anything that is on your cluster that has access to, access to this secret can decode it. And I could do a kubectl get and then pipe that through base64 decode, and I could see it. So secrets are useful, uh, but don't uh, assume they're going to protect the keys to your kingdom. Um, so let's go back and check. So in theory, ooh. Uh, so you can see I just did a curl here, and the message actually changed. And that's because my app is using the Spring Cloud Kubernetes config server. And so uh, because that's a config map that my app knows to look at, uh, I've, I've just changed the config of my, uh, of my application to be that. So it can load from, because it's a, like an a, like application properties file, it can load from an environment variable or a, 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 a config server or a file, right? And so this is basically Kubernetes acting as a config server. Uh, and so that's, that's super cool. I didn't really have to do any work apart from add like a, a line in my pom.xml to uh, load that uh, library in. Um, so that's uh, super useful. And there's a lot of uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, integration with Spring um, to do that sort of stuff. Um, but you know, a lot of folks in the Kubernetes community, uh, like one of the founders of Kubernetes, Joe Beta, and Kelsey Hightower, uh, have been talking about how Kubernetes isn't the end goal. Like, you don't, all, you don't want a bunch of developers having to write out, like, hundreds of lines of YAML, thousands of lines of YAML, because uh, that gets in the way of actually writing software, right? Um, and he, then when you're doing releases, you've got to make sure the YAML is right. And so ideally, you want uh, the platform to be writing the, uh, the, uh, the manifests, or you want, a, like, an easier way of doing it, maybe using some templating or something like that. Uh, so Helm is one of the attempts of doing that. And that's basically templating for uh, Kubernetes manifests, but also allows you to share Kubernetes manifests in a, in a nice way, right? So uh, a Helm chart is effectively uh, a bunch of files that are tarred up in a signed tarball. So you have metadata about the chart, a set of default values, and then you have your templates. 
And those can be, uh, you can create a package out of that, you can share that package with people. Uh, and there is a, a, a community Helm chart hub that has like, I think nearly 300 uh, apps right now. Uh, so pretty much any open source app you want to run, someone's already written a Helm chart for it and you can install it just doing like Helm install uh, like stable WordPress or whatever it is you want to run and chances are it will, uh, it will work. Um, this is kind of like, this is what a, a templated Helm chart looks like. You can see I've uh, templated out like the metadata and then I've templated out a few bits like the, a database string uh, and the ports for the service. Um, and so with that done, I can uh, fairly safely run a Helm install across multiple environments, so staging and production, and give it a different database string to connect to. And that way I'm not accidentally like connecting my dev instance to my production database, which I have done before when I've just been like copying and pasting uh, manifests. So Helm charts uh, give you that templating and give you a little bit of protection and allow you to easily run your application in multiple places without them necessarily uh, getting into each other's metadata and accidentally like routing to the wrong thing or using the wrong database. Uh, you create a Helm chart simply by running Helm create. So I could, um, let's have a go at this. So I do that and I kind of get a skeleton Helm chart right here. Um, and so basically this is a skeleton Helm chart that would deploy Nginx. So I won't actually do it because it'll, it, it'll take a couple of minutes to do it all, but let's have a quick look at one of the files. Um, so this is a templated out um, file. And you can see we've got like a replica count is templated out. Um, you can see the container name and the image is templated out. So I could look at this values file I was in Tmux. Uh, and you can see there's all these things that are uh, so keys and values to set my defaults. I could change that repository and tag to my Spring app, uh, and then I would change the port in the service, and then this would be a working Helm chart for my Hello World app. So it's really easy to get started uh, and super useful. Um, but that's all well and good. It's still sometimes too much stuff. Uh, so there are other tools out there that uh, kind of give you something closer to like a self-service um, PaaS-like experience. Uh, one of those things is Spinnaker. It came out of uh, Netflix, um, who have this problem right here. Um, they have like thousands of microservices at this point, and they all talk to each other, and they're all running in Amazon on VMs, right? Uh, and so that's great, I don't have this problem. So I didn't see why I would, why I would want to use Spinnaker. So I, I ignored Spinnaker for a long time. Um, other folks didn't ignore it, and they were like, this is cool. We could probably make this work with other clouds and other platforms and other artifact types. And so they got it working on a diff bunch of different platforms, and Kubernetes is one of them. Um, and that, that's where I got interested, because like, often I have an app that I need to deploy in multiple, multiple platforms, and so I'd be like this guy just bashing my keys, trying to like, write the Terraform to make it install in like five different places. Um, I don't have to do that anymore, because uh, I can use Spinnaker. Um, and Spinnaker is, uh, is really good with Kubernetes, uh, and it kind of becomes part of your delivery pipeline, right? So uh, you have Spinnaker, which is the continuous delivery part of the pipeline. So then you have like your storage artifact, your artifact storage, which would be Harbor or another uh, Docker uh, image registry, and then some sort of CI system, Concourse or Jenkins or whatever, and obviously you're storing your, your source code in GitLab, GitLab or GitHub or somewhere like that. So it kind of rounds out that, uh, that story, and rather than using like Jenkins as kind of a catch-all CI and CD system, which it's not very good at doing both of those things, instead you can say, Jenkins, you just do the CI, and I have this specifically built uh, continuous delivery tool uh, to uh, actually deploy my software. Um, you kind of have a couple of things that uh, Spinnaker does. It does cluster management and pipelines. So cluster management is basically like your multi-cloud inventory. So there's a bunch of terms and stuff it has here, but really you have the applications you're running and the version of that application and where you're running it, and then you have like how, how a person is accessing it and who shouldn't be accessing it. 
Um, and then over there you have like pipelines, which are basically how you want your uh, source to be de deployed, what you want to trigger a deployment event. A pipeline looks a little something like this. Um, this is obvi obviously a fairly complex pipeline. It doesn't need to be this complex. Um, but you basically see like some sort of trigger occurs and that then causes a bunch of these steps to happen. And some of these have failure scenarios. You know, it might wait longer. It might come back to a previous step. It might send a message to say an error happened or it successfully deployed, um, et cetera. So fairly simple. Um, each stage is a very discrete uh, unit of work. Uh, but when they're piped together, they can become quite complex. Uh, and then it supports most of like, the cloud native like, deployment scenarios. So your basic red black, rolling red black, and canary, it can do all of those. Um, I think canary is still under development, so it may not be uh, production ready yet, uh, but it's certainly being worked on. Uh, and so again, it goes back to you just worrying about writing your application, and you're not worrying about having to like, figure out how to do upgrades and uh, deployments and whatnot. Uh, and so in the end, like, this is how it should be, right? I should be talking to Spinnaker, and it's talking to my cloud, and my application is running, and everything is happy. Um, but I'm not, I'm not the smiley face here. I, I, I'm the guy that has to run this thing. And so Spinnaker coming from Netflix, who have thousands of microservices, they built like a dozen microservices uh, to make up Spinnaker. And so, you know, it's, I don't run 100 microservices, let alone 1,000. Um, I'm usually doing like five or six. And so thinking about running 12 microservices so I can run five or six, it doesn't really compute, right? Uh, and so, again, some folks in the open source community built a tool that basically manages and deploys and upgrades these microservices, and that is called Halyard. Uh, and so now I basically do Halyard, install this thing for me, and Halyard will go and install Spinnaker for you, and then you can go to Spinnaker and say, okay, now let's start configuring it to run my application. And I can show you exactly how that works. If I can find my mouse. All right, so it'll flip across in a second. I've got a, I've got Pivotal Cloud, uh, PKS Pivotal Container Service running, uh, and I'm gonna run Spinnaker on that, and then I'm gonna run an application on Spinnaker using the Spinnaker triggers to actually do the deployment for me. Right, so this is Pivotal Ops Manager. Um, this is my PKS uh, clusters, and so I've got three running, one that I've got all my CI CD tooling running on, and then I've got a dev cluster and a production cluster, right? So that's a pretty standard thing to have. Um, so I need to deploy Spinnaker, and I'm gonna use Helm to deploy Spinnaker. So I'm gonna have Helm call Halyard to install Spinnaker. So there's like lots of s steps of indirect, indirection happening, um, but it works. Uh, so I'm setting a namespace, I wanna install it in some other stuff. And while Helm is installing, this is my application. This is actually a Golang-based application. Fairly simple, hello world. Um, uh, in there, um, there's my Docker, uh, Docker file to build it, so multi-stage again, so from get Golang, uh, and then copying it into a from Alpine, so I'll end up with an image that's like 12 meg or something like that, so a tiny image, uh, which is really good. And then I have that being built uh, using the Docker automated builds to Docker uh, on a push to master or a, or a tag, so when I create a tag. And so when I do either of those things, I'll get an, an image built and push to the Docker registry. And so that means that from a Spinnaker perspective, I just need to start at the Docker registry perspective. Um, so I'm kind of skipping CI just to show the CD part off. So this is my Spinnaker install. Uh, it's still happening. So this uh, pod is being called by a job um, up here to do the actual install. Um, it's not completed yet, so I can actually watch the logs of that pod and see where it's at. So this is what, um, Halyard is doing in the background. Um, it'll take another 15 seconds or so and it will finish installing. So that's it installed. Um, so you can see all of my microservices are now running. Um, so I can do a get pods and see now all of those microservices are running as pods in Kubernetes. Um, and then I can access my app. Um, you can see uh, Helm actually ha gives me instructions on how to access my app. Um, but I have an alias set to uh, do that port forward I had earlier. Uh, so I'll go ahead and run that alias. And so that's doing a port forward. 
forwarding to uh, from localhost to uh, Spinnaker's web UI. So now I can switch across to my web browser and access Spinnaker on localhost 9000. So there's nothing set up, there's nothing happening. So the first thing I want to do is deploy my application using Spinnaker and make sure just a simple deployment works. So I tell it where it is on GitHub, my application. Um, what am I? Did it crash? No? What are you doing, Paul? It has, something went wrong. There we go. So I'm creating a server group. Uh, it's in my CI CD, no, it's in my dev cluster uh, with dev namespace, uh, and I'm calling it dev. So this is gonna be basically the dev instance of my application. Uh, and I'm telling it where the Docker image is, so the registry I was just showing earlier, uh, and then just setting some other things about ports and health checks. And so that'll go ahead and create, and it will deploy my application on my Kubernetes cluster. And so I don't have to worry about the Kubernetes manifests or anything. Uh, Spinnaker knows how to talk to Kubernetes and how to request resources on Kubernetes. So it just does that for me. And you can see it's now sees I've got an, uh, an application uh, and I've got a pod running. Um, so that ran pretty quickly. Uh, and then, so that works. I can do a port forward to that pod uh, that was just deployed, hello dev, uh, and make sure that it's actually working. Uh, and then I'll go ahead and set up uh, some load balances and actually set up my pipeline for deploying it. So there you go, it worked, port forward worked, hello world. Uh, deployed to PKS by Spinnaker, which was what it was saying in my uh, source code. And so now I will go ahead and create the pipeline. All right, so actually first I'll create two load balances, uh, one for my dev application and one for my prod application. Um, so that when they're actually up, they can be accessed from the outside world. So two uh, load balancers, and I set them of type load balancer, because the load balancer in Spinnaker relates to a service in uh, Kubernetes. So I have to set the type of service uh, as load balancer there. Uh, so those, are, those load balancers are creating um, services, and so now I can go and actually create my uh, pipeline. And so I go to pipelines, and I create one, call it deploy hello world, and then I will set a trigger. Uh, and I will set that trigger to be um, from a Docker registry. Uh, and I set the image, uh, and I don't set anything in the tag, because I don't know what the tag is gonna be when it's pushed to the registry um, by the Docker automated build. Um, so that's the trigger. So now anytime an image is pushed, that trigger will run, and now I'm building my stages. So my first stage will be uh, deployed to development, and then I need to create a new server group or a new application, and I can actually just copy straight from the development one I already created. So I do that, uh, and then I don't really need to change much apart from this containers. I'm gonna change that to be uh, image from trigger, and so basically whatever image tag comes in from the, the trigger, it will use that in the deployment. Uh, so that way as I'm popping the versions in my application, um, the correct versions will be resolved in that containers list. And then I set a, uh, an upgrade strategy, uh, and this one is the Highlander strategy, which just basically destroys every other instance of it apart from the, the new version. Uh, and again, I set some ports and some health probes, um, and then I can create it. And so that's my deployed to development uh, stage. I want some sort of stage where I can do some testing before I push to production. So ordinarily, I would like call a Jenkins job or something to do some uh, testing. Um, but for this, I'm just gonna set like a, a pop-up window that says, are you ready to deploy to production? Um, and I can click yes or no. Um, just a shortcut actually setting that up. Uh, and then my final stage is deploy to production. Basically exactly what I did just before deploying to development, just changing a few things and choosing my production cluster versus my development cluster. So I'll go through that. And again, the image from trigger. Um, and that, so that trigger basically passes along through all of the uh, stages in the pipeline. 
And I'm also setting a capacity of three, because I know that my production app is going to get some, uh, uh, some users on it, so I want to make sure I have an appropriate scale. Otherwise, the same readiness probes and ports, et cetera, get set up. Uh, and that is, that is my pipeline done. Uh, it's very simplistic, right? Ordinarily, you would have something a bit more complicated. Um, but for the sake of the demo uh, and time, I wanted to keep it simple. Uh, so next, I want to edit my source code. And of course, you do that through the GitHub UI. Um, so I'm just going to just quickly change the message that's being put through and save that off. And like all GitHub users, I will just commit it directly to master with no uh, commit message um, because you know, that's how we roll. Uh, and then I'm going to create a, a, a release tag uh, and give it a new version uh, and uh, save that off. And that will kick off the, uh, the Docker build through the Docker automated build system. So I'm publishing that release. So I now have that release called Live Demo. If I swing back to the uh, Docker registry, we'll see that there are some, bu some builds queued. Um, and then in a few seconds, we'll actually have it there. And then that push triggered my, my pipeline to start going. So it's already doing the deploy to dev, um, which will take a couple of minutes. Um, thankfully, through the magic of pausing recordings, it's already done. Uh, and so there's a little like man going like this. Uh, he's asking me a question. Do I want to deploy to production? So I should verify that it's working. And so I will sw switch across to uh, my uh, infrastructure. And you can see my application. It's still hello dev, because I literally copied the same one. So it knew that I didn't want to change things. So I just overwrote the one that was there. You can see the version is now 1.3, whereas before it was latest. So it's clearly done its job. And you can see I've got a load balancer set up. And there's the IP address of the load balancer. So I can open that up. And it's uh, giving the new, the new message. So it added the word live to the message. So clearly, the deployed development worked. Uh, and that's all the app does. So that's all the testing I needed to do. Um, so I can say yes, deploy to production. And that kicks off the final step, um, which will basically go through the same thing deploy to dev did except deploy to my production cluster and create a replica set of three. Uh, and so again, uh, that took a few minutes, but I sped it up. Um, so if I refresh my infrastructure, I now have the two applications running, hello dev, hello prod. And you can see I've got three pods running instead of one pod running, because I asked for three. Um, so that's all working as expected. And so then again, I can click on the load balancer, go down and find the IP address of the load balancer and show it working. So that's the production IP. And we just go back to the dev IP again, make sure they match, they match. And so that's kind of, that's kind of your really simplistic Spinnaker deployment pipeline. So it was a little bit of work um, to get it installed and running. Um, but once it's installed and running, it's quite easy to set things up. And it's certainly a lot easier and a lot more reliable than editing uh, Kubernetes manifests manually. Um, for fairly simple apps. If you have a really complex app with a lot of microservices that you want to all be deployed together, you can actually t point Spinnaker at either Kubernetes manifests for those or at Helm charts, and it will deploy them from those as well. So you kind of get the choice of, I'll just let Spinnaker do it for me, or you can uh, cr carefully craft a more complex infrastructure if you need to. Um, so that's kind of a lot of the basics of Kubernetes. We've got a few minutes left, so I can talk about a few other things. Uh, you can write watches that basically watch Kubernetes, the Kubernetes cluster and specific resources, um, and will act when something happens. Um, so for, exa for example, if you're running Prometheus in your Kubernetes cluster, it actually watches services and pods for certain annotations, which are a type of metadata, and will automatically monitor your application based on annotations. Uh, and that's really useful. Um, I don't have to do anything for setting up monitoring for my services and pods, apart from putting in metadata saying, please monitor this. Um, and it will, Prometheus will automatically start monitoring it. Uh, and you see there's an example. So I'm just telling it annotations of like where the monitoring endpoint is for my application, and it will just start scraping metrics. Um, Spring Cloud Kubernetes um, has watches as well. So the um, by default, it watches services and endpoints to do service discovery in uh, Kubernetes, right? It watches uh, config maps and secrets to act as a config server. Uh, and so that's another type of watcher. 
Uh, there's dynamic access control. Um, so when you make a request to Kubernetes, it goes through uh, admission controls. Uh, and you can do things like uh, put in webhooks to say, the image has to come from my registry. So you have like a little app that just like looks at the, the image name and makes sure it has your registry in it. And if not, it denies it. If so, it, it passes it. And now people who are using my Kubernetes cluster have to pull images from my own Docker registry and can't just pull any old garbage from the Docker registry, uh, which a lot of people do that. Uh, and there's a bunch of other webhooks and stuff you can do. Um, and so these are all, a lot of this stuff is done using controllers, and you can write your own controller. And there are some controllers, external controllers, I add to every cluster I deploy. One of them is the external DNS controller, and the other one is the cert manager con controller. Um, so the external DNS controller will watch uh, for ingresses with host names, will automatically go and register that host name in DNS uh, with the IP address of that ingress. It will do the same for services with appropriate metadata. So now I don't have to go and like configure DNS. I don't have to manage DNS when uh, IPs changes. It just does it for me, which is really cool. And it talks to like any of the cloud DNS services, um, info blocks, and a bunch of other stuff if it's in your data center. Um, I, I, I do not run a cluster without this. Uh, Cert Manager, similar. It will look at um, your ingresses, uh, and if you have an in, a annotation saying you want a TLS certificate, it will go and it will register a TLS certificate with um, Let's Encrypt, and it will pull down the certificate and key as a Kubernetes secret, which your ingress controller can read. Uh, and so with the DNS, external DNS controller and the certificate manager controller, everything I deploy to my Kubernetes cluster now has a host name and TLS uh, certificates just whenever I deploy a service or an ingress, uh, which is super useful. So I, I use these all the time. Um, and you can write your own fairly simply. Uh, and then if you, you can actually extend Kubernetes to control other things. Uh, and so along with a controller, you create a custom resource definition, uh, which basically is an extension to the Kubernetes API to allow you to request your own type of resource. Um, so the canonical uh, example was etcd. So it's an etcd operator where you basically say Kubernetes give me a resource etcd of size three. And Kubernetes will figure out how to deploy an etcd cluster of size three using your operator. So basically, you put all the operations knowledge into uh, an application. Uh, and so the API, Kubernetes API calls that and passes the information on. Etcd will then, the etcd operator will then create an etcd cluster for you. It will remediate failures in that etcd cluster, and it will like, scale that cl cluster up and down as you request. So basically, you're taking a lot of the effort and the manual toil of running applications and putting that directly into Kubernetes. Um, I wrote a controller for uh, the GCP cloud. Uh, and so now, when I want to get VMs or load balancers or anything out of GCP, I actually use the Kubernetes API. Uh, and I say, hey, give me a load balancer, give me a firewall, give me a compute instance. And my compute operator co coordinates that with Google Cloud and uh, gives me whatever I want. And so I actually install PKS using that. Uh, and as you can see here, this is my uh, manifest to deploy Ops Manager. Um, you see, yeah, in the spec, I'm picking a zone, giving me a name, the type of machine I want, tags, disks, et cetera. So basically, all the information that I would usually request from the, uh, the Google Cloud UI or through the Google Cloud CLI, I can now through, do through Kubernetes, which means I have these manifests that I can store in source control and I find this a lot easier to use than, say, Terraform, because it's all kind of a language I'm working with every day um, and keeps the, the syntax and stuff the same, whether I'm deploying um, stuff to Kubernetes or stuff to Google Cloud. Uh, and so I think this is a really interesting pattern. And I think we're going to see a lot more of this um, as, uh, as people start to use it. Uh, oh, and we have this thing called Pivotal Container Service. That is Pivotal's uh, Kubernetes uh, service. Uh, it's really awesome. Uh, we haven't got a lot of time to talk about it. So if anyone asks, tell them that I spent a lot of time telling you how great PKS was and not so much time talking about Kubernetes itself. And I think that is all we have time for. Um, do we have time for questions, Bob? 30 seconds. <laughs> all right, well, thank you so much. <laughs>